We hope you enjoy this video, a guide to technology for safe diabetes delivery. Please share your thoughts in the comments and make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so that you don't miss any new content that we upload. And it is now my pleasure to introduce your webinar leader, Mohammed Karamak. Thank you very much for inviting me to present the um, webinar on Guide to Technology for Safe Insulin Delivery. I'm uh, Dr. Karamat. I'm one of the uh, consultants in diabetes and endocrinology working here at Heartlands Hospital. And my role here in, um, in sort of management of type 1 diabetes it is as the lead for the service and also to try and work with regards to improving the access to technology for young patients with type 1 diabetes. So today's webinar, we're going to cover a few aspects um, with regards to management of type 1 diabetes. And if we just have a general look at some of the content that we're going to cover, we obviously are going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and its impact on speciality. We're going to talk about some principles of remote clinic consultations. And then we'll focus a bit more in terms of the glucose monitoring technologies, talk about terms such as time in range and the glucose management indicators. I've got a few cases that I would like to discuss with the audience. And then we will talk a little bit about our pathways of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about future prospects and how we see impact of COVID moving forward on the speciality. And then we'll conclude with where we see things moving forward. So I leave the type 1 diabetes service here. And just to sort of give you a little bit of context, we in our organization have close to over 5,000 patients with type 1 diabetes with almost 800 to 900 patients on insulin pumps. We have about similar numbers on Freestyle Libra, and we have probably about 150 odd patients on continuous glucose monitoring. I also have a role in medical education and lead the type 1 and uh, diabetes services, as well as the training program director for health education, West Midlands. So some of the bits I will talk about will also cover the impact, impact on medical education and how I see that. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on our clinical services. And we've clearly seen some of the big impacts, the secondment of the medical staff and nursing staff from various departments in the diabetes field towards acute and general medicine. One of the aspects which certainly we've seen is that there have been fewer acute presentations um, and we've had less access to some of the investigations. So for example, in our unit, we would normally have day-to-day -day access to phlebotomy services. Some of those services we've not had as much um, as we would have in the normal times. Clear reduction in the number of referrals. Things are starting to get back to some sense of normality, but still there has clearly been a clear reduction in the number of referrals to our departments. We've also seen some anecdotal reports that there have been late presentations of people with newly diagnosed type one. And then as training program director, I've seen the massive impact on our trainees with both sort of at the level of core training as well as at registrar level, they've been seconded. And really for the last few uh, months, they've mainly been working in acute medicine and it's got massive impact moving forward as well. We've had to adapt and work differently. And at this time, we can't really ignore the impact of people who have actually returned to frontline services and provided care in the NHS at the time of the pandemic really should be remembered. Unfortunately, some of these things have led to delivery of substandard care and it's up to us really to try and see how we can improve things. Some services have still been uh, managing, for example, the diabetic foot disease service and the antenatal service. And there are some limited number of services which have got access to technology and have been able to adapt a little bit more easily than otherwise. If we talk about what sort of impact have we seen uh, moving forward with regards to the national guidance on how we manage um, our services at the moment. Some of the services have been recommended. We need to continue on a, on, a, on a daily basis and seven day service, such as the inpatient diabetes support, some of the virtual support, foot clinics for high risk prevention of amputation, the antenatal diabetes services, particularly with regards to scan appointment and face-to-face -face review, the urgent face-to-face -face reviews for presentations such as newly diagnosed type ones, some urgent insulin starts for patients who are ketotic, or who've got suboptimal control with HP1Cs in double figures, and then urgent, monitor, urgent training for some of the devices, which we'll talk a little bit more in detail about. There are some links available here through the Diabetes UK, which can be used for blood glucose meter teaching. And then we've got other devices such as the flash glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring, 
and insulin pump and a number of pump companies such as Abbott, Dexcom, Medtronic, they've been providing online training and certainly we've been able to utilize our resources with them and they've been very, very helpful. Blood test monitoring in some aspects is really essential. For example, those with declining renal function or if patients have significant hyponatremia or hyperkalemia, again, they are really, really important. But some of the services we really have to put on hold for now, for example, our face-to-face -face structured education, such as the Daphne or in our center, we used to deliver something based on Bertie model. We've had to defer the face-to-face -face ones, but we still should be able to provide some of the online education tools and certainly the Daphne virtual and our own virtual Bertie are um, useful tools with regards to that. And then again, the non-urgent diabetes reviews have been currently put on hold. This is some of the pathways, for example, which some areas have used. So this is a London pathway, which is a little bit more sort of simple to look at and it's got a bit more tabulated in terms of which ones you see on an urgent face-to-face -face basis, which ones you could potentially do as virtual and where you perhaps could defer an appointment. So similar to what we described in the previous section, it's just a different way of um, illustrating this, um, where you go for urgent face-to-face, -face, where you could perhaps do a virtual review um, and where you could perhaps defer the appointment and actually leave things. In our center, I have to say, the flash glucose monitoring starts, for example, we've still carried on and been able to deliver them virtually with the support from Abbott and with one of our diabetes nurses mainly leading on them. So we've actually been able to do a lot of our technology aspects such as the access to continuous and flash glucose monitoring as we would normally um, do. And that's been really a, a big sort of cuts and a big advantage um, for us in our service. Now, just talking about the foot service. So some of the areas where we definitely need to focus on and need to see these patients are the critical ones, which is not really a big percentage of people with diabetes, but some of them, for example, who have signs of sepsis or acute limb threatening ischemia, they need to be seen in the hospital foot clinic. Some of the serious ones, again, need to be seen in an outpatient clinic, such as those with osteomyelitis or chronic limb-threatening ischemia, active charcos. And then you've got some of the other ones which are guarded, such as the improving um, foot ulcer or the inactive chagos. And then finally, some of the more stable ones could perhaps be relied on through telemedicine um, and home care. Now, this is a busy slide, and this is quite easily available on the Primary Care Diabetes Society website. This is just a tool from the Primary Care Diabetes Society for general practitioners in the audience in terms of how they can arrange reviews and where they can prioritize as to who to review. This is a busy slide. I'm not going to go in detail. I've just wanted to show it to you, the audience here. There is tools available for primary care, how they can do remote diabetes reviews and consultations. Let's talk a little bit about the glucose monitoring devices. And I think this is something which a lot of us are seeing more and more now with type one diabetes. So the basic sort of devices I'm going to cover about and the ones you will see in practice are the, the Dexcom devices, the Medtronic, the Freestyle Libra, and the Roche device or the Sensionics ever since. Now, in terms of the, the Dexcom G6, it's got sort of three devices, uh, three sort of parts of it, transmitter, sensor, and receiver. The advantage of it is it does not require any calibration and it can be easily attached through a sensor. With the Medtronic Guardian Connect, you do need to have a degree of um, uh, calibration, at least two per day. With the Freestyle Libra, again, you do not need any calibration. And with the Eversense, you need two sets of cal calibration per day. Um, the, some of the devices have got an advantage that they can be customized. You can view the data through the smartphone um, and you can actually link it to the smartphone and use it. Similarly, with some of the devices, you can actually link it to the pumps as well. Um, I'm not talking about the sensor augmented pump here. These are just some of the devices which are predominantly for glucose monitoring. We, um, we are aware of the, the sensor augmented pumps such as the Medtronic 640 and 670K and the latest one now coming in the market. But these are just the standalone glucose monitoring devices um, which are available. Now, how do you review the data on these devices and what sort of targets do we actually go for? So the targets that we go for in type one or if somebody is using it for type two diabetes as well, is that you can go for a time in range target and these are ranges of between sort of four and 10 millimoles per liter. And ideally you can aim for about 70% of the targets being in that range. And then if you have 5% hypers and about 30% highs, that is actually a respectable target. So these are important points to make because sometimes we have patients who are really, really hard on themselves and feel like they have to achieve time in range targets 90% of the time. And 
this is illustrating that you don't actually need to do that and you can achieve very good control if you still are able to achieve these ranges um, even 70% of the time. And if you look at some of the targets from the freestyle Libra and for good HP1C control, for example, again, if you have between four and 10, 60% of the time, you actually can have a reasonable HP1C of 7.5% or around that mark and lower. So these is just important to remember that you don't actually need to have perfect control and some of these levels can still be achieved. Now, what I'm going to do next is talk you through some of the cases for type one diabetes. Um, and there are about six cases which we're going to go through and we can talk about how we can actually um, reach management of these aspects in terms of moving forward. So the first case um, is basically an adult with type one diabetes, reasonable HP1C control around 8%. From the uh, Dexcom data at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there is perhaps a bit of variability. There is minimal evidence of high post though, and there seems to be a lot more variability with the glycemic pattern at night. I mean, if you can see the, the, um, the cursor on the screen, then you can see the extensive variability overnight, for example. And when you're looking at time in range, his time in range, which is the high one, is quite high at 51% while the within target range is sort of under 50%. So those are some of the aspects which we perhaps need to work on. So what could be the potential causes of these elevated glucose values? Could be not enough basal insulin, could be that the patient is taking a bedtime snack. We could also be dealing with aspects such as gastroparesis, which could lead to important difficulties with glucose absorption. And it could be a combination of all of them as well. Now, when we looked at this gentleman, for example, in more detail, it was obvious that they were having some rises around 1 a.m. and no real coverage at that time. So it could be a learned behavior based on experience when not snacking. And the, the, the main benefit or the main point you can make from this is that actually what you need to do is reduce the basil a little bit in the evening. So it eliminates the need for the mandatory bedtime snack. And over time, the increased time in range will happen. So how do you actually assess if the basal dose is right? You check the blood glucose level when there is no boluses in the system and no carbohydrates in the system from the last meal. And then you compare it to the morning readings. If those readings are similar, you can be confident you've got the basal rates correct. But be on the lookout for variable bedtimes. And if there is over sort of two, two and a half millimoles per um, rise in glucose, then you raise the basal insulin dose. Um, and if there is a fall in the similar range, then you actually can reduce the basal insulin dose. So those are just some tools and some principles that you can use. Um, and in this first case, those, that could be a nice way of managing his diabetes. So the learning point from our first case doesn't always require a midnight snack. So this whole concept of you have to give them a midnight snack, we should move away from that. They don't always need that. Night times here do not need to be reflexed to increasing the basal dose. You need to look at that. And my next case will demonstrate it again. Then you determine if the issue is related to the background or the basal insulin, or is it related to the bolus insulin? And often the nighttime hypers need to be addressed with more insulin before bed. And this is some of the tools which we always uh, sort of teach that in diabetes and particularly in type one diabetes, you look behind first and see what has actually happened before um, to make sure that you can make the adjustments to the treatment and lead to an improvement in the control. So I hope that takes the audience through our first case. Our next case um, is where we could look at another scenario. This is somebody who's using the Freestyle Libra and you've got an estimated A1C of around 7.8% or as we should use the term now, the glucose management indicator of this value. And you can see still a fair degree of variability. And again, if you can see the cursor on the screen, there is a rise in the glucose levels going over overnight. So when I'm reviewing an ambulatory glucose profile, I tend to look at this sort of um, parameter first. And then the next parameter I focus on is on the day-to-day -day one. So what actually is happening on the day-to-day -day basis? And the, the thing to note here is that it's actually not that they're rising every day. So this is where you need to refine your consultation. And yes, the pattern might have been that it was rising, but actually when you look on the day-to-day -day basis, it is not rising every day. And as a result, when you look at this, you can see what days is it actually rising. And then when you actually explore that in more detail with the patient, then you get the response that actually it was related to some alcohol intake over the weekend, for example, which actually led to the rise in the glucose. And when they have not had that, the actual ranges have been absolutely fine. 
and the levels have been quite stable. So if you had actually made the change in this patient and increased their basal insulin, you could have induced more hypo. So it's important to go through the data and actually explore the history and know a little bit more when you are reviewing that with the, with the patient. Now the next case is a little bit uh, um, more sort of a recent case in our in our service is a 52 year old gentleman who's had type 1 since the age of 10 he's recently started using libra and he started using it to make changes to his insulin doses he has noted some improvement in his gmi and his hp1c normally on lantus and he's on humalox doing some carb counting roughly 1 to 10 units and lantus insulin twice daily 32 units morning 32 units evening with a statin and other medications now, looking at his uh, Libra download, when he came to see us in virtually through the clinic, again, overall, when you look at it, the median line does not look too bad. But when you look at the traffic light signal of the red, amber, and green, you can see the likelihood of low glucose is quite high. And actually, it is quite high a lot of time, apart from sort of first thing in the morning, the likelihood of low glucose is there pretty much at all times, while the median is not too bad at all. So what you do next is you try and address what is happening on the day-to-day -day basis, as we said earlier. And you can see quite often he's actually losing some aspect of his hypo-awareness. And quite often you need to look at that aspect as well and teach them in terms of how you're treating hypoglycemia. Again, overnight difficulties with hypoglycemia and at times not being treated properly. What did we do with this gentleman? We actually switched him over from insulin lantus to insulin receiver to try and achieve better control. This was his pre-change background, and you can see the extensive number of hypoglycemia episodes is having 13% hypos, a lot of them towards the evening and particularly overnight. So we switched him over to insulin receiver and went for a 20% reduction of his basal insulin at night. And this was his post-change uh, parameters. And you can see the likelihood of low glucose is better. Still amber, not ideal, still not green, but still much better than where we were before, where the likelihood was very high and in the, in the red range. So just in terms of looking at this, we switched over an insulin to a different long-acting insulin with perhaps slightly better evidence for nocturnal hypoglycemia and did see some improvement in the glycemic control. Um, and that's what the sort of overall snapshot looked like after the switch. It's not perfect by any means. There is still a fair bit of variability overnight, but certainly the first major point we wanted to address, which was the risk of hypoglycemia, we seem to have addressed that. So let's look at one of our next cases. We have a 61-year-old lady with um, about 49-year history of type 1 diabetes. Again, started um, on Libra and then was referred to our clinic. Currently reported no acute concerns, happy with using Libra but did mention that her glucose levels tend to go quite high when doing spin classes and tends to drop quite rapidly. HP1C was 7.9%, which was an improvement. And she has been having um, experiencing about four to five episodes of hypos and has a gold score of four. So just for the audience sake, the gold score of four basically means there is a degree of impaired hyperawareness. Any gold score of four or above means that the patient is actually not recognizing the hypoglycemic episodes as well as they should be. Also got a previous history of a thyroid condition, hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid. So let's look at her Libra. So when you look at her Libra, you can see quite clearly a likelihood of low glucose overnight in the red parameters and a reflex rise in the glucose levels first thing. So this could be an, an illustration of the dawn phenomenon. The rise, however, is happening a little bit later as well. So this could also be a reflection of what her insulin to carb ratio with the breakfast is or with how her insulin resistance works around that time. And then you can see that the likelihood of low glucose is less of an issue afterwards, but certainly in the early morning, the glucose levels are running quite high. So this was just a, another way of looking at it, the snapshot. So you can see again, the risk of hypoglycemia mainly sort of overnight or early hours of the morning with a fair degree of variability first thing in the morning. So this lady was already on basal bolus regime with insulin and placebo. And the next step really for somebody like this was to have a discussion with her with regards to going on to insulin pump therapy. And we were able to convince her after she had initially not been extremely keen on that to switch her over to insulin pump therapy and following that and making the tweaks to her basal doses overnight and to her insulin to carb ratio. These were her glycemic uh, parameters post those changes. Again, there is a bit of a, a rise early morning, but certainly nowhere near as pronounced as we saw um, pre those changes. And we were actually able to see an improvement again in her glycemic control 
compared to where we started earlier. Now, the next case is something which um, is quite going to be topical. We're just going to talk about somebody right around COVID time. We've got a 34-year-old gentleman who actually works in the health service. He is known to have type 1 diabetes and has actually been on insulin pump and also initially had been self-funding for Freestyle Libra and then once it was approved, it's been funded for Freestyle Libra through the NHS. Previously, he's had type 1 diabetes for over 30 years and he's been on two Medtronic pumps in the past and a Roche pump as well in the past for two years or so on Libra. Now, what happened was this was his Libra data, um, just sort of, as you can see from the dates, just early on during the COVID time. Now, the glucose data, you can see extensive variability. Target is 50% roughly, so not particularly reaching the aims that we would go for. And quite a lot of 41% readings being in the high range. And really from a work pattern point of view, the impact of the variability with his glucose levels on his work was being quite pronounced. So he was actually due for a renewal of his pump funding around this time. And we had a chat and based on some of his... Um, the risk of hypoglycemia with, this, with, the, with the health sector where he's working in and with the fear of hypoglycemia parameters, we felt he met the criteria for a sensor augmented pump and we put him on a Medtronic 670G. Now, I'll just show you the data for his 670G um, and you can see the, the improvement already. So you can see pretty much his median glucose levels almost running in a straight line, still a bit of variability, but the beauty with the 670G being the auto mode and he's actually been in auto mode over 90% of the time. Um, and really, the improvement is quite pronounced, is 73% is within target. And this has all happened at the peak of the pandemic, when he's actually been working in a really stressful environment on a day-to-day -day basis, dealing with COVID patients. And it's really been a godsend for him. Um, and he basically, we reviewed him briefly last week, and his, his, his own words to me were, um, this has really been the best thing that has ever happened to me for diabetes management point of view. So quite nicely, if you can select the right patient, um, you can see some improvement and you can see how these bits of technology and these aspects can actually make quite a big difference in terms of their, in terms of their parameters. Um, and with the 670G in particular, if you actually have the person who um, is letting the device kind of uh, be the guide as well and working with the with the device and with the team, you can see some pretty, pretty good control. So this is just something I wanted to share with you um, with regards to some of the aspects we've seen around COVID time and how we've managed somebody who was really, to be fair, struggling a little bit with his glycemic control um, around COVID time. Um, our next uh, case is another lady who has had issues with type 1 diabetes for a number of years. She's known to have significant complications for retinopathy and neuropathy as well as um, nephropathy. She developed hypoawareness and had been managed on insulin pump therapy until she was noted to develop severe hypoglycemia. And at that point, we commenced her on Dexcom G6. So she was not keen on a wired pump and she had been on an Omnipod before and hence we had gone for a Dexcom G6 rather than as we discussed in the last case, the Medtronic um, system. So no hyperawareness at all. And really it was identified when she'd come in for some blood tests and then we had people sort of uh, ringing her number and kind of buzzing at her home because her glucose level was one on the blood test which she'd come in for. Otherwise she had no recollection that she'd completely lost hyperawareness. So this was her first sort of parameters when she first went on to Dexcom. And what you can see quite clearly is the extensive variability with how difficult the glucose levels are. And really the fear of hypos is driving how high she's leaving her glucose levels in the double figures at 13.2. And again, with very extensive variability of about 4.6. So we started using the Dexcom alongside the pump started to see some improvements. So let's look at her next one. Averaging a little bit better than before, 10.3, estimated A1C 8.1%, still absolutely no recollection of hypos at all. Still having significant um, severe hypos at times whenever she's going low, no warnings whatsoever. So we felt this lady should be programmed further and she was brought up into our islet transplant clinic. She was processed forward through the islet transplant service and again, basically around before the pandemic, sort of towards the later part of last year, she went on to have a transplant. Let's look at her data. This is a first kind of data post-transplant. Glucose in control improving, 7%, average 8.5, a degree of variability, but not as bad as before. 
And when you look at her next one, which is a few weeks after she'd had the transplant, I mean, this was amazing. Look at that absolutely plumb sort of straight line, standard deviation of only 0.8. And this is one of our real successes from the islet transplant. Um, and that was something that we saw quite, quite nicely with regards to the parameters. Now, talking forward with regards to the pathway for hypoglycemia and how, how we can manage that. With regards to the pathway of hypoglycemia, a suggested pathway is that if they've experienced a severe hypo in the last year and or their gold score is above four, in the first line, you would consider either structured education for multiple daily dose injections with glucose monitoring, or you go for a hypoglycemia specific education. You second line, consider insulin pump therapy alongside blood glucose monitors, or you can go for an MDI therapy with a real time continuous glucose monitoring. In third line, you can use a sensor augmented pump with or without a low glucose suspend and very frequent contact. And then the final step could be the consideration of islet transplant to see how that works. When we move on to this lady, for example, islet transplant seems to have been a godsend for her and she's really had fantastic um, response to it. But again, you need to go sequentially through the pathway and actually select the right patient to get the best benefit from um, these procedures. And as we would say, you need to weigh the pros and cons because there is the use of anti-rejection drugs, which these patients need for life. So it is not going to be something for everybody. You need to select the right tools and the right patients to actually um, look at that. When you're looking at somebody with a high glucose pathway, for example, then you can actually have a similar section where you have somebody with high blood glucose, HP1C, for example, above 8.5% or greater than 69 millimoles per mole. And you look at what is happening? Has the patient got a worsened um, score, distress score, diabetes distress score? If yes, then you need to follow that pathway because that's essentially driving their high control because of hypoglycemia. If they haven't, then you go for access to technology. You can look at perhaps a blinded CGM or a real-time CGM. Insulin pump therapy is also obviously funded with HP1Cs above 8.5%. Above but I would again say that the access to specialist services, structured educations, and the uh, refresher sessions are really, really important. And again, access to health professionals such as the diabetes educators, diabetologists, psychologists, really essential part of the service. Um, we can't emphasize enough the importance of the clinical psychology team within the pathway of type 1 diabetes. So these are all pathways that you can explore. But in general, these sort of tools can be useful to follow as a pathway for hyperglycemia. In terms of the next parameters that we can look at, um, Again, you can look at how the things are happening. So um, when we go for our next case, this is very brief one. I just wanted to show you guys one thing which I've noted myself. And again, audience, um, and they're contributing, would be useful to um, hear something from them as well. This is one of our ladies who's 30 year old, currently in the antenatal service on type, uh, known type one for 15 years, on pump and has been funded for Libra. She, she was on from the pre-pregnancy clinic. Normally excellent control, HP1C very well. And you can look at sort of what her control has been like um, while using the Freestyle Libra. And this is during pregnancy, her average glucose is 6.9 with a glucose management indicator of 6.3%. Um, and again, the variability is not too bad at all. It's a reasonable range. However, the thing I wanted to point out here was when you look at in the target ranges and the average, so average glucose is at 6.9 with percentage within target being 81%. And actually the highs being around 10% and the lows being around 9%. Now, when you look at this lady is also using um, an Omnipod pump so she can monitor her blood glucose level and it may not dem demonstrate on the screen excellently, but when we looked at her parameters around the same time, really roughly around the same time on the, the through the diacin, she's actually got only 66% within target and about 30% of the readings are high. So she's been very, very um, anxious in terms of what does she rely on. There's a clear discrepancy between the, the levels she's getting on the Libra and what she's getting on the blood um, testing that she's doing. And again, I think it's important to remember this, that the Libra is detecting the interstitial glucose, not necessarily the blood glucose, there can be a lag. And it, particularly in antenatal settings with the postprandial rises sometimes and the fluctuation postprandially that you see, it is important to recognize some of these aspects can cause a degree of variability. 
when we go forward to some of the other aspects, say for example, some of the checklists that you can ask patients to maintain, you can ask them to rely on at least six to eight sort of scans a day, changing if they're on a pump, cannula and reservoid, Timing 20 minutes before, really, really important. Aiming for variability of around three. This was one of the questions which was asked in the audience as well as I was flicking through that the standard deviation or the variability that we are aiming for is around three or lower. Percentage within target, we've talked about earlier, around 60% or above and changing the cannula or reservoir, as we said, every two to three days. Top tips, use the ambulatory glucose profile. It's a great tool. Assess the basal insulin. It's not as daunting as it might seem. It can be difficult with the postprandial peaks, timing of insulin crucial, and let the patient guide you. Some of them have had type 1 diabetes for 40, 50 years, and they are their own experts of diabetes. And as we say to them, they are managing their diabetes 365 days a year. We are here to guide them, to allow them to have the support to manage it. I'm going to now cover some of the bits which I see in future in terms of COVID-19 and how services are going to be impacted and what do I see the future in terms of moving forward. So the revolution in diabetes care, the first bit is face-to-face -face versus virtual triaging. Which ones do you see face-to-face? -face? And you could use virtual triaging by using the traffic light system, as we talked earlier, a red, amber, green. Those who are, for example, a newly diagnosed type 1 or insulin initiations, you you'll need to perhaps do a face-to-face. -face. With amber, for example, those with raised A1Cs with comorbidities, unstable complications and disease, problematic hypos, you could do a virtual triaging and see which ones of those actually perhaps need to come to the service and which ones you could do virtually. And then the green ones, I suppose you could continue to follow them up virtually and provide them the support that you need. But it's important to actually triage the patients correctly and look at doing face-to-face -face versus virtual triaging. So we had somebody booked in, for example, in one of our um, virtual sort of uh, clinics and actually it was quite clear that the person would be much more suitable for a face-to-face -face appointment as we were going through the phone it was quite difficult to to get through all the information and actually help them um, and so what we ended up doing is change their appointment and actually trying to support them on a day-to-day basis choosing the right modality for interaction for people with diabetes so it can be a telephone consultation which is probably the predominant one i've done so far but it can also be a video consultation. So for some of our transplant clinics, we have recently had one, for example, that we've reinitiated. We've tried to use video consultation. There are different systems. There's the Attend Anywhere, the NHS Attend. We use a system in our trust, which is called Video Connect, which seems to be working reasonably well. Um, you can also have email correspondence. So we use in our service a pump and a separate Libra sort of emails and patients can use that to ask questions or actually let us know, for example, when they've uploaded their data and they want some information. Choosing the right time as people are now starting to return to work, it is important to sort of make sure you get the right time. Most of our clinics are between nine to five and it's useful to actually identify that time frame with the patient as to what time you would be perhaps liaising with them and contacting them and speaking to them. The e-consultations for GP practice support, linking in with the GP. So as part of my role, I also do some community diabetes sessions with the GPs and do some MDTs. And they are really invaluable. The amount of uh, interaction that you have with GPs and the amount of education you can impart on them and actually what you can learn from them as well is really fantastic. You can actually provide fantastic support and get really good support for your patients as well from GPs. Um, and simple things like, for example, ketone meters, the importance of that for all patients with type 1 diabetes. When you're going out into the GP surgeries, you can look at those aspects and, and improve that. But a lot of those are currently happening with us virtually at the moment, and we are looking in the process of restarting them. E-consultation for patients, and again with GPs, we have a system in our area called Consultant Connect through which GPs are able to contact consultants. Um, and actually, again, they could have a patient sitting right in front of them as they ring you and get the advice. And that can be a very useful tool for the GPs and help them get the right support from the specialists um, right then and there. Um, and that certainly from my um, discussions with the GPs has been a very, very useful tool, which they've found invaluable. So you just need to be flexible and actually look at which way um, is the best tool for which patient and select the right, whether it's the telephone one, whether it's the video, whether it's the face-to-face, -face, and again with the GPs and with your interaction with other healthcare professionals, see which tool is the best one for them. 
Um, key messages, outpatient services have been really severely disrupted and, and decimated, really. Um, and I think the, the challenge here is going to be, um, this is something which people like Pratik and Amma have alluded to recently, is really the impact on smaller units, which is going to be really significant. The recovery of lost activity will be challenging. And I think we need to really look at getting back up to speed as soon as possible and do some risk stratification as to which patients with diabetes should be seen first which patients require urgent support, whether it's in primary care or those under specialist teams. And I think it's important that as diabetes teams, we learn from some of the innovations and new technologies that we have used during this crisis point to build better models of care, which doesn't loot our carers um, and their families as well to try and enable them to have the best tools and the best support that you can offer them. We believe that during the COVID crisis, the NHS has been responsive. We've shown a willingness to modernize more in the last few weeks than it has in the past number of years. And I think in many instances, the virtual clinics, I mean, a simple thing is, for example, my DNA rates have completely disappeared. The DNA rates are completely negligible at the moment for all our clinics that we've been doing over the last few weeks. But there is a lot more that we still need to do. As clinicians and as our patients, we're all supportive of the changes. This is likely to be the new normal. COVID-19 is not going anywhere soon. We are not going back to our routine way of delivering care. And it is up to us as teams to look at the ways of delivering diabetes care, which would be different and which would be better for patients, which would support our patients better and actually deliver some of the virtual cares um, that we can provide. Um, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to be quite happy to take any questions now. So we've got some questions that have come through. The first one is, what is an acceptable level for standard deviation? So um, I think it briefly alluded to in one of my slides as well. Um, three is probably considered a reasonable level and I think un, sort of three or below is considered acceptable and above three is probably where I would say it's it's a little bit um, too high. So you need to look at perhaps improving the variability. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So next question, for patients who exercise, do they receive education and support to the temporary basal rate and or just adjust carbohydrate and insulin? Absolutely. So I think there are a lot of tools around to support patients to self-manage their diabetes with exercise now. Um, there is websites, for example, like runsweet.com. There is aspects such as XTOD, which my colleague, Dr. Partner Rindran and Rob Andrews run, um, and certainly we are part of that um, team as well. And those are tools which we can use for our patients. And also it's important that when you are doing your consultations with the patients, whether it's virtually or face-to-face, -face, a discussion on exercise and how to manage your diabetes with exercise should be an essential part, just like we talk about driving, about hypos, this is also a really important part of our consultations to support patients. And there are simple principles, for example, how would you adjust the basal rates by cutting back on them? How could you make changes to the insulin to carb ratios around that time? So those are tools which are really, really important and you need to actually look at what exercise they are doing, whether it's an aerobic exercise, whether it's an anaerobic exercise, they will both be impacting things differently. And then use the right tools to support the patients, um, but use the tools, as I said earlier, like xcarbs, runsweet.com, xtod. There's a lot of tools that are available and by all means, please make use of them. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. So next question is, what are your experiences of the transplant service and what successes have you had? So we've had uh, probably around eight patients so far in our service who have had transplants done. So we run the regional um, clinic for the islet transplant service for the West Midlands, alongside colleagues from Oxford. Um, and essentially, uh, seven out of eight patients, I would say, have regained hyperawareness. So the results have been fairly, fairly impressive. Um, there's only been one case where we've not had good results. Um, and there's clearly were aspects which then you re sort of look into with regards to compliance and also with regards to compliance with the anti-rejection drugs, which perhaps contributed to problems there. But overall, in regards to hyperawareness, awareness, which is the main indication in the UK for eye transplant, the results are fantastic. The um, insulin independence data, however, is not as good for islet as it is for a whole organ pancreas transplant. So if you actually have got a younger patient and their aim is insulin independence, then perhaps you might want to discuss with them about pancreas transplant service as well. Um, it is a much more bigger procedure with a higher morbidity mortality risk, 
However, the chances of insulin independence are higher than islet transplant. That's great, thank you. Whilst we have various tech options for those with type 1 diabetes, and rightfully so, I sometimes find it difficult to fully advise those with type 2 diabetes on insulin via virtual methods. Any suggestions? So, I mean, one of the tools that can still be used for virtual methods for these patients if they have a meter that is compatible is the diacent because the diacent or the gluco, um, I still call it diacent or gluco, whichever you want to call that, you can use the uh, meters, most meters it is kind of uh, um, linked with. And as long as they're using a meter which is on the diacent and you can ask the patient to um, have their own kind of username and password. It's available in the form of an app on their phone as well. And what we do is we have, for example, a department username and password that we use and the patients are provided that link when they first go on to blood glucose meter and then we can actually access some of their data. So we use it a lot in our antenatal clinic and obviously a lot of our patients in the antenatal clinics are either DDM or type 2 diabetes and it still leads to fairly good consultations and, and very good um, very good sort of uh, virtual um, results. So I think diacendoglucose could be a method that you could use even in those who have type 2 diabetes on insulin um, and that could still do a good virtual consultation. And again, with a lot of the meters as well now, there is pathways available through which they can download it um, and they can actually send that data electronically to you, whether it's through PDF or whatever route um, and actually be able to um, do that consultation. Okay, that's wonderful, thank you. Do you use the hypoglycemia pathway as a criterion for CGM, i.e. Medtronic 670G? So yes, I think in our uh, pathway that we have for continuous glucose monitoring and for flash glucose monitoring, the criteria for sensor augmented pump and CGM itself does include impaired awareness or um, unawareness of hypers. We use gold score of a four um, for consideration of uh, continuous glucose monitoring. And essentially, we, 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 you, you can still use Libra in the others, but in those who have got impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, we tend to use um, CGM for gold scores of four or above. Having said that, we can actually still offer in some scenarios Libra if they've not got on with CGM in these patients. And also the fear of hypers is one of the other tools you can still use. Um, for um, commencing continuous glucose monitoring. And you can perhaps rely on something like a modified Clark score as a good tool to guide you with regards to those patients. For the new trainees, it is a bit, it's a bit difficult to catch up with new technology given very minimal knowledge and experience. Have you got any advice? So my advice is to look at some of the presentations and some of the information available on the ABCD DTN website. There is very good resources available with some excellent presentations from people like Pratik and Amma. Um, and they are really, really useful tools, which I would recommend strongly for the new trainees um, to actually be able to link in with that. Um, and I think you will be able to find a lot of useful information and a lot of useful webinars, which uh, would be good for you to link up and sort of get your skills started. That's great, thank you. What are your plans for insulin pump upgrades? Do you do any virtual pump upgrades? So yes, we have done virtual CGM starts. We've done some virtual pump upgrades with the help of the companies. Um, and we've also now started to do some face-to-face -face upgrades as well. Um, with our staff going out into patients' homes with full PPE. So we've kind of relied on, on different tools. Um, and I think the way we've sort of phrased it sometimes is because patients do sometimes get a little bit concerned in terms of, oh, am, am I going to make a fool of myself? And some of our staff is quite good in that. I say, oh, yeah, we'll join you, with, we'll join you as well. <laughs> and we'll both do it together. So that way they actually feel comfortable. Um, and so we've done some virtual pump upgrades like that. And as I said earlier, virtual CGMs as well. And as you saw with one of the cases, we did a virtual pump and CGM start as well during COVID, um, which went very well. Okay, that's great. Are you able to type the support website for exercise, please? Apart from Run Suite, I didn't catch names earlier. So Are you able is, to yeah, share yeah, those? Yeah, I can share that. So it's uh, one is X dot E X T O D, um, and the other is X carb E X C A R B. So those are the other two that you can use. Great, thank you. Have you come across any challenges when doing remote consultation for type one diabetes, 
um, on pumps and CGM? And if so, your, what are your suggestions to overcome these challenges? So yes, we have come across some interesting ones in one middle of one consultation. We actually abandoned it, told the patient to go and get something to eat. So there has been some interesting uh, scenarios as well. While on the phone, you could recognize that actually this is um, the glucose levels might be dropping a bit too rapidly um, to our liking. So we actually abandoned it and then sort of one of our staff kind of then communicated with them a few minutes later and called them and kept making sure that through the evening they were all right. So yes, we definitely have challenges. And I think one of the um, areas which some people have alluded to as well is there is a lot of different tools and a lot of different technologies available. So when I'm doing a clinic, for example, I've got LibreView open on one side, Dyson open on another side, I might have a care link open on another side. So you've got so many different sort of tools um, and that sometimes can be a little bit um, uh, difficult to actually get your get your head around um, but these are challenges and I think this is what we essentially are going to be how we are going to be managing them but it's useful to um, and to, to follow that yeah. for, for using you, CDM, yeah. yeah for, for using CGM and impaired hyper awareness do you just rely on gold score it's very crude and subjective it's a it's a very valid point, and I think we did initially, certainly when um, we I initially started leading the service for the first couple of years, we used Clark and modified Clark. What we found was the completion rate was not as good as I would have liked. And then when we submitted the business case, we wanted to include something which the CCG would be comfortable with in terms of being completed by everybody. Um, and in order to not necessarily completely and only rely on uh, really people who are very much experts in the field of type one and the only ones who can really complete modified clocks and those. So we actually kept it a little bit more flexible and kept it a bit more easier for people to complete. But what we do is where we are not clear and we're not sure and the goal score is maybe around three, four, and we're not sure whether this is actually still in that category, we would then complete a modified clock. And we certainly use a clock and a modified clock for all our islet transplant clinics. So we do not rely on um, gold, as you've said correctly, it's crude and sometimes subjective. So we don't rely on it for some of our more specialist hyponavianus clinics or the islet transplant clinic. But we do it in a basic tool in our type one service. And then if we need to explore it further, we do the modified clock or clock. Okay, great, thank you. So the next question is in regards to Freestyle Libre, um, AGP report, can you use the estimated HbA1c or, or MPDA? So that's, I'm presuming that's the National Diabetes, Pediatric Diabetes Audit or something like that they're referring to. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a tricky one because mostly you find it kind of links in quite nicely, but then sometimes you do see, a, you do see some differences. So what I would say is if you look at the variability alongside and the variability is reasonable, then I think it can be a useful tool um, to rely on. But Abbott themselves have now kind of uh, illustrated this and said, you don't like using the phrase estimated a and and instead they want the term GMI or glucose management indicator being used. Um, so calling it estimated a and is perhaps not as accurate and sometimes that can cause problems. Okay, thank you. Can you recommend any online resources, preferably free to learn structured approach to AGP interpretation? So if I just take the first one as well, because people, I think it's the, because they're both kind of similar. So the website as well that I referred to, and as a response to this question as well, it is the ABCD-DTN, Diabetes Technology Network. Um, so the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists, ABCD-DTN, Diabetes Technology Network. And that has got a lot of really good resources. Um, I think the AGP one might have been done by Emma Elmott in terms of um, how it is, uh, um, how it is sort of uh, illustrated. Um, so I think they are really, really good tools, and I would strongly recommend any beginners actually that they can go through that uh, as a structured way of demonstrating it, um, and uh, that can actually put you in a good step. That's great. We also have um, Ian Cranston delivering a diabetes um, Libre View data interpretation webinar for us in a couple of weeks' time and we will be sending out information about that in the coming weeks. Um, so that should be helpful for that. Absolutely, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the difference between GMI and a H estimated HBA1C? I think the main difference really there is that actually they did not want to continue using that phrase 
the estimated A1C because it seemed to imply as if you were checking patients HbA1c. So that's why they've kind of mentioned now that they want to use the phrase GMI instead. So that's certainly the correspondence that I've had with Abbott that they felt like they could be challenged on saying this is like an HbA1c. Um, so they wanted to kind of differentiate between them and hence they've used this phrase. Okay, that's great. So um, how long would you expect the eyelid transplant to work for? Does it have a max time to keep working? So amongst our patients currently, the longest one we've got in our service is probably about five, five years, I think, post-transplant. Um, and she's still got complete hyper-awareness. But generally speaking, even in the ones who were insulin independent just post-transplant, within 12 months, majority of them have needed to go back onto it, some amount of insulin. It might be just a bit of insulin with meals, not necessarily basal, but they have needed to go on to insulin. And it partly is because I think in the in, in the UK, we, we are a lot more aggressive with restarting insulin and actually protecting the eyelids. If you looked at the data from Canadian and other countries, then it's probably a little bit different. And they are less kind of stringent in terms of initiating insulin. And then they've lasted a lot longer. But hyper awareness wise, you've seen good data five years. And if you looked at some of the Canadian data, even up till 10 years, you have very good data for hyper awareness. Okay, that's great. Um, so back to the question box. Have you had any challenges where someone with a Libra is not scanning enough, i.e. only one or two times daily? So, yes, absolutely. You do have people who are not scanning adequately, and I think that's where you need to then go back and look, did you select somebody appropriately for initiation of freestyle Libra? We, uh, I don't like these phrases, but we do sort of use the term when they first start here with us locally that this is a contract and part of that is that you have to scan eight times a day and if you're not scanning eight times a day and we do a virtual review for them in about four or six weeks we can actually write to the gp to say look we decide to not fund it continuously forward we do still give them a little bit of time but usually by six months time if they haven't been scanning adequately then you do need to look back at whether that's the right person and whether they are in the right frame of mind at that stage to actually engage with their diabetes. That's an important point because they might not be in the right frame of mind and it might be something which they might be used, might be more appropriate for them a few months or a year down the line, but at that moment in time, it may not be the best thing for them. That's great, thank you. Um, there was a question um, in the chat asking, um, please could we have the link for the resources for exercise and titration? Are you happy to share those with us and we can email yeah, them out to people course. early next week? Of course. Great, thank you. Um, I do believe that's every, all of the questions, unless anyone else has any that they'd like to send through now. Um, in regards to um, all the previous webinars that have been mentioned uh, throughout today's webinar, they are available on our YouTube channel. So if you go onto YouTube and type in SBK Healthcare, it should bring up all of the previous webinars that you can catch up with um, and this webinar is also being recorded and will be uploaded early next week as well if there's any colleagues who may want to watch it that have missed it and oh there is another question how do you deal with challenging patients started on pump by peds but clearly not managing it very well <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a challenge sometimes. I think the, this is where perhaps the um, importance of a good service where you're linking in with your PEDS team is really important. Um, and actually, if you are kind of linking in with them right from the word go, then you, you are aware and you're prepared for how to actually engage with different patients. But it is a challenging area and sometimes it's not very easy, um, easy to work with. You can use different tools. So one of the things we did, for example, was we have run specific um, sessions just for that age group. So we have a couple of our sort of um, nurses and dietitians who work predominantly with the uh, PEDS team and transition team. And they run some service specifically for these uh, sort of patients and these group of of patients so that can be a nice tool to actually rely on you can run some specific um, sessions so some of our uh, structured education sessions that we run locally are uh, particularly built in with uh, some of these parameters to be um, adjusted and to be addressed with the um, with the peds team alongside these patients so that's kind of some of the tools we've used but it is a challenging area and i i'm not going to say we always get it right sometimes we do struggle with some um, some cases absolutely okay 
Thank you very much. Um, that is all we've got time for today. But thank you um, very much for sharing all of that. We certainly did cover a lot of ground. And um, I would just like to say thank you to everybody that joined us today as well. Thank you.